Okay. It is Tuesday, October 1st, 2019, and after a hiatus, we are back doing human action. Now, I thought we had not finished chapter 20, so I, I thought we would be finishing that. It was a long and complex one. I definitely mm -hmm. needed to revisit it. But um, Brandon read chapter 21, so he's ahead. We might just bleed right into that if we can. Yeah. I say we should do it. Um, so where do you want to pick up from? Um, I mean, I guess since you've read it four times, let's just try to go through it from the beginning quickly. Oh, God. That's a real challenge. So we're testing my reading comprehension skills. Yeah. Okay. Okay. God damn it. Uh, what is the definition of the neutral rate of interest? And what is the definition of the gross money rate of interest? I should have gone through these and just looked really <laughs> smart because then I have all yeah. the answers. But Here, I, it's right here. Okay. The neutral rate of interest is hypothetical. Right. Single rate of originary interest, i.e. the rate of... Markup on consumer goods compared to the factor, factors of production. So it's like conceptual. And then yeah. the gross money rate of interest is an actual number. Mm -hmm. Like it can be measured from, from time to time. Right. Yeah. The entrepreneurial component in the gross market rate of interest. How does the entrepreneurial component in all species of loans manifest itself? Well, um... People who are giving loans are entrepreneurs. Right. They are invested in the creditor, and they expect a return. They could lose everything. Right. So they're th that is their business. They're entrepreneurs in that respect. If the uh, if it's not the state. <laughs> because they can't lose. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, they can't. I guess it just looks different. <laughs> um, the price premium as component of the gross market rate of interest, the price premium, uh -huh. how do the speculations of the promoters influence the gross market rate of interest? The speculations of the promoters influence the gross market rate of interest. Um, well, and then why can't price premiums render the interest rate neutral? And how do price premiums come into existence? Well, I feel like we should answer the, the last mm -hmm. one first. Price premiums uh, come into existence by being the difference between um, getting something now before the, the, um, the market adjusts for uh, greater demand. Right. Um, so the demand is high and you pay a premium to have it now. Mm-hmm. Versus later. Versus later. And uh, why can't price premiums render the interest rate neutral? I think because everything's always changing. So the interest rate can't be neutral because uh, conditions are, are always changing. Mm -hmm. And then finally, how did the speculations of the promoters influence the great gross market rate of interest? Well, I think that the, the promoters go around, and I think that he uses that as a term for marketers yeah. and like people who are selling things, they go around and buy up the, the capital goods that they need to turn into um, consumer goods, and they, they increase the gross market rate. They're the first ones to start increasing that rate. Because right. They're the ones or they could demand. be on the other side. The speculators could be dumping and lowering the rate as well. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. They anticipate some change. Mm -hmm. Great. Wow. I feel like I actually understand <laughs> this chapter. Yeah, zipping through. Bam. Uh, the loan market. What does the rate of interest, what role does the rate of interest play with regard to business planning? Well, um, oh, the loan market. Right. So an entrepreneur might get a loan expecting that they can... Um, do stuff with their business and then pay back the loan um, with the profits that they make. But with regard to business planning, you have to factor in the, the rate of interest 
um, when when planning for that, and the the rate of interest can change over time. So mm -hmm. it might look like you made a lot of money as a as an entrepreneur, but really the um, amount of cash in the system has has changed. So if yeah, there's so inflation. If, mm, okay, so if the rate of interest is lowered, you really hasn't haven't made as much money as you think you did. Right. Yeah. How does the supply of money affect the market rate of interest? Ah, then we just answer that. And how does mm -hmm. it affect the originary rate of interest? How do we define the originary rate? <clears throat> the originary rate is the interest rate, just in mm -hmm. general. It's the um, price that you pay for something now versus later. Um, so the price of money now has a higher price than money later. And most things. Yeah, presumably. Unless the, the interest rate is negative. That's a good point, yeah. Which is ridiculous, but yes. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right. The effects or of changes in the money relation upon originary interest. What are the consequences of forced saving for originary interest? So if there's forced saving, then there's more... Uh, uh, money available for um, giving loans, which makes the interest rates go down. Right. And artificially, to, to an artificially low level, where they wouldn't be. Um, and Mises makes a really interesting point here with regard to if people really believed that it was good to force people to save to make the interest rates go down, then they would tax the middle class and give the money to the rich because then they're, that's not going to turn into consumption. They, they can just save it. Mm -hmm. um, but people don't actually do that. They don't really <laughs> believe that. So it's not actually good. How can inflation provide the illusion of profits? I think you already <clears throat> talked about that. Again, yeah, we just um, shared. If, if you, as a business... Um, are able to charge a lot more for your products because of inflation, you think, wow, I'm so smart, I'm doing so great. Um, my business is taking off. But if in actuality you're not really making profits um, in, in real terms, then you could be losing money despite a nominal, uh, a nominal profit. Mm -hmm. The gross market rate of interest as affected by inflation and credit expansion. How can it be that the German Reichsbank's discount rate of ninety percent was in the fall was in the fall of nineteen twenty three a low rate? Because credit expansion and inflation was so goddamn high. Mm -hmm. Way too high. So ninety percent could be low if the inflation rate is higher than that. Was a low rate. Okay. A discount rate of 90%. No, so normally that... Okay. So are they saying the interest was 90%? Like, what is it, what does this 90% discount mean? A discount rate of 90% was a low rate. I think that they are saying it's a loan, so like it could be that, I don't know if the word discount here is synonymous with interest rate, that's how it would make sense to me, but maybe, maybe that's not oh, okay. correct. Would, okay, so. Because if if it was read if it read, how could ninety percent be a low interest rate? I yeah. would be like, oh well, if the mm -hmm. inflation and credit expansion is too high. In what way can credit expansion create booms? Are they durable? What are these boom? Why are these booms not lasting? Not long lasting. Okay. 
So you expand credit to a bunch of businesses, they take a bunch of loans, they grow their businesses, expand their um, operations and their, their plants, and then they make a bunch of widgets, and then are they durable? No. It ter- and why are these booms not long-lasting? Because then they make a bunch of stuff that nobody needs. Yeah, they're, they're bad investment. Yeah, mal-investment. Mal-investment. Not just over-investment. But mal investment, where they're they're like, oh, people need um, spaceships, and they're like, no, no, actually, no one needs a spaceship yet. It's not time for that. Um, so then they collapse. How can a general rise in prices occur? Uh, I think first the. It's like, the, who, who's first? Who buys up the things first? The speculators. The speculators, right. They're like, hey, I think something is amiss here. I'm going to buy up all this wheat. Mm-hmm. And then people are like, hmm, the price of wheat is really high. Now my alcohol is really expensive. Okay. Um, then they, they buy up all the alcohol, and then they're like, huh, all, this, uh, all these wages not enough we got to raise the wages for the bartenders and like it just the general prices increase because one item and then another and they all are interconnected connexity what are the differences between an artificial boom created by credit expansion and a normal expansion of production with regard to capital goods well with an artificial boom created by credit expansion, there's malinvestment. A normal expansion of production with regard to capital goods is you're getting a market signal that says, hey, make more of these widgets because they're so in demand, you gotta, you got to expand your plant. But with credit expansion, people are like, Oh, well, I could expand my plant, so mm-hmm. why don't I just do that and see if we we make more money, but then they don't. Yeah, and I guess the the obvious one would be that artificial boom usually has this, like, crack, what do they call it, a crack top? For C- crack up boom? Crack up boom. Um, it doesn't always. It can be averted. If the banks see the writing on the wall ahead of time, mm-hmm. they can avoid a crack up boom. How? Um, by raising interest rates. Okay. Right? Don't you think? Presumably. Misi said something about how banks will sometimes... It, a crack-up boom doesn't have to occur. That's the worst-case scenario. It could just be a regular boom-bust cycle, and it's almost never the case that a bank sees the writing on the wall and does the right thing it's just that they they are forced to through market conditions Mm -hmm. to to do a correction somehow if one wants to know whether there is an artificial expansion underway where should one look this Mm. is a guess i would say the interest rate he says in the book which is just part six. He says where you're supposed to look, and I forget. <laughs> but it's probably important. We should be looking at it right now. I mean, I guess it's the, if it were not for continual and indeed increasingly injections of new money into the loan market, the boom period would come to an abrupt end. I think that's kind of fitting because the Federal Reserve has been injecting billions of dollars of cash into the market over the past couple of weeks. I, I Yes, I have heard that i've also heard in more recent days that they have been removing physical cash 
from the um, I don't know what you call it, but from the economy, oh, from the market, from the world. So yeah. at the same time that they're injecting digital cash in onto yeah. balance sheets, they are removing physical cash. Right. Uh, cause you can't have negative interest rates when people can hold a piece of paper, but when you have to keep everything in the bank, then it can be negative. Wow. I had not considered that, but that does make sense. Boy, that makes physical cash seem extra valuable to me. Yeah, definitely is. Wow. Until it's illegal. Uh, yeah, you're right. But it will still be even more valuable. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> if one wants to know, oh yeah, uh, why is it important to stress the difference between malinvestment and overinvestment? Seems like overinvestment is like a, a natural phenomenon. Like, someone gets carried away. Yeah, and just over invest where it's like you're going in the right direction you just like you poured too much in your cup whereas like now investment is you're just you're pouring it on the floor bingo yeah <laughs> I think that's a great way to put it why do commodity prices not necessarily rise within a period of credit expansion ah <clears throat> Another typical mistake is to equate expansionary credit policies with rising prices. Yet, this need not be the case. In an unhampered market economy, the output of goods and services tends to increase year after year, providing a tendency for falling prices. In this context, credit expansion may simply offset this trend such that actual prices remain fairly stable. This is what happened during the 1920s in the United States, when conventional price indices indicated neutral monetary policy. In fact, the seeds were being sown for a massive bust. Seven. The gross market rate of interest as affected by deflation and credit contraction. What are the essential consequences of deflation and credit restriction? Well, if there is credit restriction, it means there are fewer people making loans that would mean that the price of loans should increase. So the interest rate should go up. That would be the essential consequence. Deflation. Right, and so then there's not an, I guess there's underinvestment and people aren't investing in goods, so things aren't being made and created. Yes, probably fewer things are being made or created during that period. The problem with deflationary credit con uh, contraction is not as important as the inflationary credit expansion. For one thing, it's politically unpopular and so governments do not typically pursue such a policy. Another important difference is that credit contraction has, lasting, has no lasting ill effects. It may temporarily interrupt borrowing and hence production but once the interference ends, business can resume as usual. This is not the case with inflationary credit expansion, because during the boom period, the capital structure is physically depleted. Real savings and investment re must restore it in order for business as usual to continue. Okay, so I guess capital will build up during that period. But when it ends, you... You don't need that buffer time to like reaccumulate you because you already have it. To reaccumulate what? Reaccumulate capital to invest because when you have inflation, you deplete all of your capital. All the capital is depleted, so there's no savings. Uh. And so when that period ends, you have to have a, another period of like reaccumulation versus the deflationary period. 
you're just you're like accumulating like your capital capital never gets depleted so when it ends you can just go right into like a, a cycle perfect okay cool that makes sense to me the monetary or circulation credit theory of the trade cycle what are the two shortcomings of the British currency school according to Mises I do not recall, so I'm going to cheat. First, it thought only injections of new banknotes could cause the boom period. However, in reality, unbacked deposits will have the same effect, which is just what we talked about, where the Fed is not necessarily introducing new banknotes. Uh, they are injecting what we would call money substitutes. Digicash. <laughs> Digicash, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the second shortcoming, the currency school only analyze the cycle in terms of, one's country, uh, of one country's banking sector expanding while other banks exercised restraint. This focus mistakenly led them to conclude that the problem was the drain on the expanding country's reserves. They completely missed the issue of the derivation of the market rate of interest from the originary rate. So... They completely missed the issue of the derivation of the market rate of interest from the originary rate. Oh, deviation, excuse me. Mm -hmm. I was like, that doesn't make any sense. So, yes. <clears throat> In an unhampered market-based economy, uh, market based on commodity money, it is theoretically possible that sudden discoveries of gold, for example, could hit the loan market at an early stage and cause a boom bust cycle. However, there are two reasons that this is possibly that this possibility is insignificant compared to government engineered credit expansion with unbacked fiduciary media, which is I think what's happening now. First, there is no reason for new gold to enter the economy completely through the loan sector. Second, and more crucial, it takes real resources to dig up new gold or other commodities. The danger of new money hitting the loan market is falsifying the rate of interest oh and falsifying the rate of interest is infinitely greater in the case of printing up banknotes or adding numbers to an electronic record of reserves which is all that is required for credit expansion with fiat money Mises clearly didn't see the giant gold meteor head straight for earth is there one? <laughs> I don't know I think there's a giant gold meteor out there that they find they found great i want some yeah i don't know how far away it is but it's like a common troll when you talk to gold people oh you say that's that. funny <laughs> oh well um can a new influx of gold create a credit expansion yes yes temporarily but it's unlikely yeah and it's on yes and it wouldn't be as damaging as fiat because it actually takes real work to do. Unless the meteor just hits and... Unless there's a meteor that lands and produces stamped gold coins <laughs> on its way down. <clears throat> the market economy as affected by the recurrence of the trade cycle. Why are there always unsold, unsold inventories in the changing economy? Because that's just how life is. There's always going to be unsold inventory in, a, in the changing economy. People's needs change. People, you know, entrepreneurs are incorrect about mm -hmm. their assumptions about what people want. And there's always going to be unsold inventories in the changing economy. 
Can unused capacity justify a credit expansion? Unused capacity. I would say no. If you have unused capacity, like a plant where only 50% of your machines are working, it doesn't necessarily make sense to take on a loan to operate 100% of them because the demand might not be there. So you might only have demand for, you know, the 50 widgets a day that you produce, and you don't need to produce 100 widgets mm -hmm. a day. Yeah, I'm thinking uh, in terms of buyers. Like, if you had a car dealership and none of your cars are being sold, does that mean people just don't have enough money to buy the cars? Oh, right. That's a different way of, of thinking about the question. Um, that's unused capacity. Could that justify a credit expansion? I would say no. It's still the... the Purchases have to come from savings. They can't just come from... It's, it can't just be, oh, give people credit so that they can buy these cars. Because maybe they, maybe they do need that, but it's not the fact that they're sitting there and they can't, they're not buying them that makes that necessary. I don't know. Does that make sense? What, yeah. do, what do you think of the answer to this question is supposed to be? I mean, I think the answer is supposed to be no, but I f like you know you have a hundred used cars. <laughs> hey. Hey. Good morning. Good morning. Um. Like I could see how stimulating the economy a little bit could help. Where if you have a ton of brand new cars sitting there. I guess that just means that car dealerships should go out of business because they make bad investment. And by expanding the credit, you're just encouraging that bad businessman to continue to make cars mm. that people don't want. Yeah. The previous... If there's unused capacity, then presumably... There was an error somewhere along the line. Yeah, it was malinvestment. Yeah, so... Or overinvestment. Mm -hmm. Can there be a non-monetary explanation of the trade cycle? Well... I would say yes, because there are other cycles in life, like seasons or like particular harsh winters i feel like could start some type of cyclical phenomenon i'm t i'm torn on this issue because money is part of every transaction in the economy mm -hmm. so how could it be how could there be a non-monetary explanation of the trade cycle think of like an extreme like winter case or like yeah just like an extreme like credit expansion or is like one thing that could lead to a cycle but like what if like there's a giant like hurricane or something and then that would be a cycle though that's just but an extreme yeah, it creates a cycle, but within that cycle, things are being traded. Like so, I guess more like bottled water is being being manufactured, or I think that I think that could affect trade in a cyclical manner. Ah, I think we have an answer here. Okay, check this out. The fallacies of the non-monetary explanations of the trade cycle. <laughs> so you're wrong. Even the theories of the boom-bust cycle that rely on real factors, real in scare quotes, <laughs> must assume that there is a credit expansion to allow their story to play out. Thus, everyone concedes that an inflationary credit expansion is necessary for a boom and bust, while some still deny that it is sufficient the crucial feature of a business cycle is the prevalence of forecasting errors in general. 
In the market economy, there are always entrepreneurs who make mistakes, but the profit and loss system tends to weed out those who cannot learn from the past and reward those who best anticipate the future. Any particular theory of the business cycle based on non-monetary causes must explain why the entrepreneurs involved are incapable of noticing the pattern even though the academic has written books on the topic. I'm not sure that says you're wrong. It just There could be non-monetary booms and busts. Not, me, as a, not as a cycle, because the reason it's a cycle is because the monetary planners always respond to the top and the bottom of the cycle by doing the thing that makes it go up or down. So, like, their goal is to make it a cycle. Mm. Well, I'm trying to think through this. If there weren't money, then people would be trading cars for this and that, but then that would become the money, the thing that they trade for those things. So there, there has to be a, a monetary explanation in the trade cycle. You pointed out that people who make cars that are bad should go out of business instead of getting additional credit. Yeah. Well, that's the same with people who live in, hotel, in the hurricane areas. Like, mm -hmm. they shouldn't live there. <laughs> <laughs> or they should get better insurance or... They probably do have insurance, but, or they get bailed out by the federal government. Yeah, that's true. But I feel like for, like, what about one in, like, a century type of event? Like, people, no one's ever going to plan for that. Because I don't understand how, I plan for some of how those. it would become a cycle of credit expansion and, and a contraction. Well, I guess, well, what is a trade cycle? I guess I'm not clear on the definition. How are we defining trade cycle? Boom and bust, I would oh, think. A boom and bust. Yeah, and maybe not. I wish I had a third microphone that I could pass you. Yeah, Would you good. check out the camera, make sure it's still recording, please? It appears to be so. Great. Thank you. All right. You that, thank you. That was chapter 20.